Ladies, welcome back to the podcast. I'm very excited to introduce you to my friend, Tracy Desjardins. Oh, how do I say your name, Tracy? That was perfect. (laughs) That was it. Yeah, oh, perfect. I, you know what? I have to say, I am the actually like the worst for that. With every interview I have, I always say in my head, make sure you get how to pronounce their name right. And I, I don't think I ever have in all of my two hundred and whatever interviews I've done. I forget. Well, you know what? You know what? I've been called. This is Tracy DiGiorno, like oh. the frozen, pizza, like the frozen pizza in the USA. So you know, nothing shocks me anymore, but it's not Tracy DiGiorno, it's DiGiardins. <laughs> All right. Okay. So <laughs> you guys, Tracy DiGiardins <laughs> is a certified health and wellness coach, mind body eating coach, fitness professional, and best-selling author of The Diet Free Diva. With decades of experience in fitness, Tracy now focuses on coaching holistic wellness for women, specializing in emotional eating recovery, and healing from the damage caused by dieting, binge eating, and sugar addiction, which I know we can all relate with. Oh, I've been thinking so much about my own history of this, so we're going to maybe have to jump into that too. But Tracy, welcome to the show. (laughs) Oh, Karen, I am so excited to be here. I'm honored to be part of the other side of weight loss and to be having this conversation with you. So thank you so much. Yes. So I met Tracy, everybody, because she has interviewed me twice for the Sugar Summit. Or is that, no, what's it called? The Sugar Summit? Sugar Summit. I'm like, that that doesn't make sense. Okay. The Quit Sugar Summit twice. So I talked about hormones and their impact on sugar addiction and So Tracy, I said, Tracy, you've got to come on my podcast because I really liked talking to her so much. And she's very knowledgeable on this topic because of her own history, of course, with sugar addiction. So let's start there, Tracy. Tell me all about it. What was life like? (laughs) Yeah, you know what? I would like to start. I'd, I'd like to go way back because I think that a lot of your listeners might be able to relate to my own personal story. So I grew up in the 70s and I was a little girl that was slightly chubby and had a sweet tooth. And I was the one that always wanted to finish off everybody else's cake. I was always the one that wanted more and couldn't really understand why other kids, you know, didn't want to finish their cupcake. Like, what's wrong with you? So, you know, I I really kind of felt like I stood out and I really didn't care when I was really little. Like, I like sugar. What's the big deal? I was a free spirited little girl, made lots of friends. Life was good. I got in trouble for laughing in the classroom all the time. And and it just, I was one of those like big mouth personas, but life was good. And I liked who I was. That's a big part of the story. But you know, when hormones start shifting, Karen, and you know this, like at the ginger age of 11 and 12 for a little girl, things start happening like overnight almost. So I went from like having like unruly hair and I wore pretty plus clothes that with the elastic waistband in the seventies, it was... It wasn't, they only, there was only so much of a selection in the pretty plus clothing for girls. And I, I really didn't give a rat's ass if I'm allowed to say that on your yes, show. Yes. And they were comfortable. They were like today's yoga pants. But when I turned 12 in the Jordache jean phase was in hmm. and I was chunky to wear the designer jeans. So then my, my radar went up like, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm quite the driven kid here. I, I can get a result. And I bought into my first diet at the age of 12. This was like fifth, sixth grade. Wow. And, you know, Karen, like my so-called sweet tooth took off like a firecracker because I started dieting. Right. Of course. And it was like, you know, the Charlie's Angels were on TV. The Barbie doll was who she was. And that's, that's another whole topic we could have. But I, I, I fed into the media images and like the other pretty girls in my class who were who were very thin and, you know, thin was in like that was the thing. Like I heard that in my family. Thin is in. And there was part of me that's like, well, OK, you know, to be successful, I need to be thin. Well, let, mm-hmm. let's do something about this. So I, I tried like restricting food, you know, and I, I just watched what other girls were doing, what like other adult women were doing. Oh, you have skim milk and saltine crackers and hard boiled eggs and carrots. All right. Well, I would try that. And that would last for like, I don't even know, maybe a week. And then it was the sugar. So my sweet tooth turned into a way that I was rebelling against myself and the world and anybody that wanted me to be thin. I couldn't put those words together then I'm putting it together now 
But that aspect of me, Karen, now I'm I'm saying starting at the age of 12, I was probably like 15 pounds overweight, you know, and yeah. the doctor's office, the annual physicals were a disaster because, well, you know, Tracy, you're off the charts a little bit with this problem. And um, I just kind of felt like a rebel about it, but I kept going. I kept trying because we learn in school, pick yourself up, try again, dust yourself off, keep going. So it was the willpower. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And I got really intense about it. I got I had like a vengeance. I'm going to conquer this thing. I'm going to, I'm going to get thin. And I had ebbs and flows of losing weight through high school. I, I, I developed a binge eating problem. I was never anorexic or bulimic, but I was the girl that just didn't know why she couldn't stop binging on sugar. And of course, nobody talked about that in the eighties. No, I was always in private stuffing my face with little Debbie snack cakes, anything I could get my hands on. It was usually the cheap stuff. And, um, Nobody talked about this. There was no help for that kid who couldn't stop using food the way that he or she was using it. And so guess what developed? The shame, the self, I couldn't trust myself, didn't like myself, got into some, you know, promiscuity, you know, somebody like me, somebody approved yes. of me, and it was a disaster. And I, that version of me needed me now. Yeah. Well, I've gone back and rescued her, quite frankly, from a spiritual level. Yeah. But it was the chronic dieting that kicked my sugar addiction into full force. I uh, professionally, I got into fitness. I of course, doctor and a trainer, and I was I did that for work. And I loved people, and I loved music, and I loved making life great. When you get into a room and you turn on the music really loud, or a bunch of women are jumping up and down, sweating, life is good. We create energy. It's positive. And I love that. So that was that part of my personality putting into the world there. But at the same time, it was kicking my rear end because I was trying to out exercise the binging I was still doing because, you know, as a fitness person, I was supposed to have it together. Yeah. I, did. I was going to say, did you feel so much like a fraud? Oh, it was awful. Yeah. It, and I also, I, it also took a toll on what I thought of myself mm -hmm. and I was never good enough. I never measured up. And, and with my clients that I work with, that's a common theme of this not enoughness. Mm -hmm. It's really out there. And I really believe it, it can be rooted in a troubled relationship with food early on in life. A lot of these, a lot of ladies listening in, did you start dieting? If you did, when, mm -hmm. you know, how was that for you? Did it work for anybody? Because I've been in fitness for over, over 35 years and I can't name one, not one. Uh, client or woman that I remember that went on a diet program, whatever it was, lost the weight and kept it off. Plenty of people lost weight, but are they still doing that plan? It's fascinating. It is. Yeah. So hormonally, Karen, fast forward, got married, two kids. I'm still, you know, battling with food, battling with sugar. It was, I still had the sugar binging problem as a result of trying to wrestle my relationship with food. I became like this obsessed, healthy eater. You know, I worked in gyms. I had all the knowledge, right? Yeah. And people were coming to me for advice and I felt like an idiot. I felt like a fraud. I felt like I was not being truthful to them. Um, I, I knew how to eat healthy, but I didn't know why I was eating donuts at 3 p.m. most days of the week. And on Fridays, it, a lot of donuts because, you know, yeah. it's Friday. Yeah, and, I love um, a good donut. Damn it. <sighs> well, it's the, it's the disastrous combination. Oh, of it's yeah. the worst. <laughs> Yeah. And so, uh, where was I going with this? Uh, okay. So my binges, uh, I wasn't recovering as fast in my forties as I was in my thirties and my twenties. Okay. Wow. Hormones yeah. shifting, right. Karen, yeah. my yeah. hormones are trying to talk to me and, um, I, you know, I, I, I ended up owning my own personal training studio and then fast forward, I turned 50 in 2020. Oh, and what you're 50. Hey, Oh, I'm 53. Right 53. Now. Yeah. Oh, I, I <laughs> thought you were in like your early 40s. Oh, I love you. You look so really? amazing, Tracy. Yes. Oh, oh yes. it's just the light. It's the light. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, take it. Take it. You can appreciate this. Okay. So 2020, May 7th was my 50th birthday coming up and it's January. And just like I did every year, ladies listening in, do you set goals after Christmas, right? In that last week of December, nothing fits. We feel tired, we feel bloated, and we're pissed, and we're ready to do something about this because we want to feel better as soon as possible, which usually means let's set a weight goal because that's what we've been taught to measure success with our bodies. Well, geez, I'm going to lose, you know, 20 pounds. I said, because I didn't know any different. And here's me. I'm like, 
I was also a certified health coach doing nothing with it because of imposter syndrome. Right. Oh my gosh. I had no idea that it was up until recent that this was all going on. Oh yeah. And here I am blabbing it on your podcast to the world, a shameful secret that I kept locked in my heart, locked in my head. And I wore a mask that, you know, I have all the answers. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I had a weight loss goal. I'm finally going to get the best version of me by the time I turn 50. And I started the same, like, okay, Uh here's my diet plan, my clean eating diet plan. This is what I'm following. When we follow a diet, we turn off the lights on self and we shine a light on somebody else's rules. Right. A lot of times that can, they can be our own self-inflicted rules. And we have tunnel vision with food, Never mind everything else that has a lot to do with being healthy. Um, and so, you know, that usually would go well until about Super Bowl Sunday in the United States. And, uh, and then I would get bored and then I was slipping back into, you know, here we go again. Yeah. And then pandemic hit pandemic hit and I was forced to spend just like everybody else. We had to close our businesses. We couldn't control anything and we had to be alone with self. And Karen, early on, early on, because I'm a control freak, I started my high school days binging on ice cream. It went full force. Like I'm 17 again, using food, using sugar. And I felt like I was going to die. I was having ice cream every night for dinner, like not just one pint. It was bad, but that was the wake up call that I needed. And I said this next part a million times on interviews, like I felt like God kind of took me and lovingly shook me like a rag doll. Like, can we be quiet now? Can you listen to me? Because if you keep doing what you're doing, menopause is going to hit you with a hammer and it's not going to be pretty. Mm -hmm. It's going to get harder or you can surrender to me and realize that you need help and let me help you. And that's when I did. That's what I, I'll never forget it. No. That's when I met the amazing Danielle Dane. Oh, I found, I'm getting shivers. <laughs> I was so desperate. I found these, like, what is, I started researching. I have a problem. Okay. And then I found the quit sugar summit. All these people are talking about sugar addiction. Like, where have I been my whole life? Right. I've been fighting. I've been fighting my own ways. And I was blind to see the help that I needed. So I worked with Danielle and she literally pulled the cover off of my trapped ego. And she helped me get to the roots of why I had the sugar binging problem and the roots, the digging and the digging and the digging with Danielle. I discovered that it started with my chronic dieting at the age of 12. Then I got pissed. I did. Yeah, good. It was an opportunity to dive deep with myself. And I started, I opened my, my, this laptop right here. I just started journaling, typing what was on in my head. I just started typing. And I realized my, what I call in my step one in my book, food story, I started to write my food story. And it was like, my history with food from as far back as I can remember. And I started to pinpoint the problems and therein was my healing. And then I, I thought, well, I was doing a sugar. I was, I was not eating a sugar. I, I gave it up. I did a, a detox and it was one day at a time surrounded by a community of people with Mike Collins. And I did the work and I started to discover who I am when I'm not high on sugar, sugar oh, fog. Right. And it is a high, it's a, it's a fog. And I lived my whole life like that. It blew my mind. Here's what, here's what happened next. When I realized who I am, who I really am without the sugar, I was ready to take life on with a vengeance. Closed my business down. My my heart's really in health coaching. And that's what I'm now. So that was my segue in healing. But had pandemic not happened and I didn't give myself the space and the presence and the quiet to go inward, I'd probably still be doing it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Let's go, 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 go. Yeah. You were so sucked into what majority of the world is sucked into. And especially because you were in the fitness industry, all you're being told constantly is you just need to go on a diet. You just need to exercise. Like they, it never goes beyond that. It's just, you're a failure if you can't stick to this healthy eating plan and this diet plan, which it's just the most frustrating thing in the entire world. I I spoke with somebody yesterday who's a client who's also a health clo- coach. And she said something about the fact that, you know, before jumping to medications or anything like that for helping women with their food cravings and addiction, 
that, you know, they just need to, they just need to eat better. They need to stick with their healthy eating plan. And they, that's what that has to come first. I will never go and touch any of those medications or peptides or whatever. And she was like really kind of up in arms about it. And I, I thought, how you can't, I said, I completely disagree with you. I said, because sugar is an addiction. And so you can't, you, you, it's not as easy as just follow the freaking plan. If it was that easy, nobody would have sugar addiction. And it's like telling the cocaine addict, okay, you can have, you have to have cocaine every single day or else you'll die. And we're going to put the really good cocaine in front of you all day long, but you're only allowed this really crappy cocaine and only in small amounts throughout the day. Like that would never happen, but that's what food is. We have food in front of us all day long. We have to eat. The world is shoving these like highly palatable foods in our face constantly that even the best of us who have no sugar addiction or, or issues with that find it very hard to resist. So you put on top of that emotional issues, addiction, body self-image problems, whatever compiled, and you think it's going to be that easy just to just to stick to the plan of healthy eating. It's not, it just can't be. So it's, I don't know. I just get frustrated when people think that this is an easy process. And I dive in on something you just said that is so powerful when you said, you know, the healthy eating, the majority of the women that come to me and reach out to me from my book, the diet free diva, check this out. They're no stranger to eating healthy. The women that yes. come to see me, that reach out to me are women like me already eating healthy. They know what to do and they're doing it with all they've got. And they have no idea why they just check out it, like the snap of the fingers and they're turning to sugar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like an archetype called health champion. Oh, you know what I mean? chronic dieter slash health champion persona. Yes. Somebody's showing up at the table, making the eating decisions, the chronic dieter, the health champion, first thing in the morning. Yep. We got this. Yes. As the day goes on, our energy starts to get low. We're starting to feel those emotions. We need something, but we've never really, maybe I was one of them learned how to attune to our own needs because there's a process there called mindfulness that a lot of us have never learned. So we just start to feel something, something, and we're not done with work or whatever that is. And so like a light switch, something goes off. We, we disconnect from self, we go dark and we turn for the sugar. Yeah. Those are the typical clients that come to me because they, they don't know what they're missing. They're eating healthy, but I, they say, I don't want to want the sugar. And we do a lot of work around that. And um, seeking pleasure in food. When we're dieting, it, diets actually teach us how not to eat. Yeah. <laughs> it's so true. It's so backwards, it's isn't it? It is backwards. It's backwards and people are still doing it. And the industry is still yes. making billions and billions yes. of dollars off of us at our lowest of all lows. Yes. Think of it this way. In the United States, Karen, you have all the holiday foods out in December, October, uh, November, December, all the holiday foods, the last week in December, take note, you got the slim fast, you have all the keto stuff, all the diet programs, they all come out there front and center in the grocery store, because that's how we're going to spend our money. They all know that we're feeling like crap. So they're going to lure us in with all that stuff. So people like you and I are taking a stand like, Hey, you know what? Wouldn't it be great? if we listen to our own intuition and figure it out how we can get through the whole year, fit into the same amazing genes without dieting and actually trust ourselves with food, that's my baby. Plus emotional eating challenges, which are which do not get enough attention in the world. And it's really, really a big thing. Yes. So how, let's just jump right into that because we know that in order to quit the sugar, in order to eat healthy, lose weight, that it does require not eating the sugar. <laughs> but yet I know that if we tell ourselves we can't have this, we mm -hmm. have to eat X, Y, Z and follow the plan. 
that it is just a matter of time before that fails us. We know that 95% of diets fail. That's in your book even. And it's like, but yet, how, so how do we get around that? I mean, I, I have my own solution, but I want to hear yours. <laughs> well, you know what? I will speak from personal experience. And this is what I, I help women embrace for themselves as well. Uh, the focus on food gets too much attention. Focus on food. What, what am I supposed to eat? What should I eat for this outcome? Okay. And it's a, it's a rigid diet, toxic diet mentality. When we start to approach, okay, I'm going to eat healthy. There are rules and restrictions and all of this. And we're focused on the rules and the restrictions. And that is a, a certain mindset. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I love to do, and I do this early on with my clients is who do you want to become? Let's dream. Let's talk about what's important to you. Chapter, my chapter two talks about values. Let's discover who you really are and who you want to be. What's, what's an ultimate, like you ultimate version of self. What does that look like? And when we do that work and envision that version of you, then we can, before food, then we can talk about, well, how would that version of you, your best self how would that person think in relation to food feel and do what are the things that that version of you would be doing how would she be thinking because there's work that needs to be done around the mindset and the programming that needs to be different than yes. when we're on that same old diet that is where the roots really are is learning how to think differently and that's not easy it's no. kind of like learning, learning German. I don't have to speak German, yeah. but I start with German 101 and I just practice and sit with it and think about it and give it some time. Things can start to shift, but we're so stuck. And this is what makes me so mad. You know, your listeners listening in, if you grew up in the seventies, eighties, in the nineties as well, and the fat free revolution, you know, we were, we were sold on a concept of thinking. We didn't just develop this, it, you know, I mean, we, we bought into this and rewiring that so we can find sustainable results is really a huge part of this process. And you can't buy that with a credit card. Yeah. <laughs> you can't buy it with a credit card. I, it really involves some inner work. And this is what I, I, I work on extensively with my clients. In yeah. fact, a lot of them come to me, like help me get off sugar or help me stop dieting, or I need to lose weight or whatever. And we start, of course, I meet them where they are, but by the end of our time together, Nine times out of 10, they're saying, you know, this had not, this had like so much more to do than just food. Yes. And they just <laughs> freedom. They discover how to trust themselves again and how to make promises and keep their promises. And that feels really good because dieting teaches nothing about how to trust yourself. In fact, it, it yes. robs of any, any intuition or self-trust that we have. And that feels really crappy. It With really everything does. Diet, we pay the price of more of our self respect being drained. Yeah. Yeah. I just, the lady I literally just got off the phone with, she, she, she's asking me, well, what macros do, should I eat? She's yeah. like, what, how do I, can you, yeah. can you tell me right now I'm doing this, this, and this. And I, I realized I was only eating 900 calories a day. And so I've, I've increased that, but what, what should my macros be so that I can lose weight? And I was like, Oh, I was like, look, you're not going to want to hear this but you've really got to tune into yourself. I said, I know that that's like way easier said than done because you're, we're so brainwashed into looking outside of ourselves for the answers. I said, but if you're hungry, you need to eat and you need to, you know, if you're not, if you're overeating, then you need to cut back. Like you really need to pay attention to what your body is signaling to you, which that can be very convoluted. Like you can, you know, because if your body's telling you to eat the sugar, you're going to go eat the sugar. It's like that intuitive eating thing. It's like, yeah, that, that works for some people, but a lot of people can't work because if they listen to the, what their body's saying to them, they'll go eat the sugar. But if they would just go past that layer and go, okay, what am I actually really wanting here? Why am I looking for that quick, quick fix of energy, quick fix of feel good dopamine hit, what am I really needing to do? Or, you know, if you're eating, pay attention. Are you feeling full? 
Are you, you know, like, are you resisting eating healthy because you're telling yourself you can't have the sugar? Like as soon as we tell ourselves that we want to rebel against it. So there's all of these things. I don't know. <laughs> you know what? You're, you're so right on that. And can I just expand on something that you just said? If you would have told me in my throes of my binge eating, you know, Tracy, you know, um, go inward and you're intuitively, you know, you really want to be healthy. And I, my middle, every middle finger I have would have gone up. Like, look, <laughs> totally. Crap. It ain't working. Tell me something else. And the thing is, you're right. You're right. And anybody out there that's listening, like, okay, you tell me to intuitively eat. I read that book a long time ago. Okay. Yeah. You tell me to intuitively eat, eat what you want. Don't be deprived. Okay. Well, I'm going to eat donuts all day long. Here's the catch. Here's a question. So yeah, we'd love to be able to eat donuts, but how do you want to feel in your body? I'm 53 ladies listening in, especially if you're going through this perimenopause, I don't, I don't, even if you're, even if you're not in perimenopause or menopause, it could apply to anyone. How do you want to feel in your body that can dictate what you put in your mouth and chew and swallow? I'm kind of like a cut to the chase kind of girl, because that's what I needed to hear. Well, you know what, when I eat a green apple and a side of almonds, I feel great in the afternoon. If I have a little Debbie snack cake or two or three or four, that was me, I'm going to feel like complete crap. When my husband comes home, I'm going to be a total grouch and I'm going to have to go to bed because I just, I got nothing. But when I have the apple and the almond, I feel alive in my body. I feel alive in my mind and I have energy to live my life to the fullest until the time I decide to go to bed, not when the sugar conks me out. So let's, you know, like there's a conversation with self around, mm -hmm. well, of course the donuts and the ice cream taste good. The little Debbie snack cakes, they can't, of course it tastes good. It's going to give you a result in your body. So think about how you want to live your life. Mm -hmm. My son's about to get married. I, they want four kids. I'm elated. Bring it on. I want to be the most energetic grandma on planet earth. That means I have a reason why I'm eating the green apple and the almonds, whereas I used to eat the little Debbie snack cakes or worse. So this is what I help women do to understand, well, how do you want to, who do you want to become? And how do you want to feel on your body? Because of your values, you want to, this is important to you, this and this, and you want to live like this. So guess what we all need to live life on purpose? Energy. Yes. Yeah. Most exactly. women are craving, I want to have good energy. So we have conversations around that, but like the intuitive eating is amazing. But you tell that to somebody that has a boatload of unwanted eating concerns, they're going to give you the middle finger. But I love doing work around that yes. and helping, helping my clients see the light because there's the freedom. Yeah. And that to, to teach them how to tune in, right? Like here's how, what you're going to, how to be mindful and it's so much easier to just go to the next best diet out there. This, this is work. This takes work and you have to be prepared to do the work. I really believe that. Like, I love that, that, what did you call it? The food story, write your food story. Like that's a really good place to start. Oh, yeah. mine went to hell when I was in at 14 and I was put on birth control pill and I got super fat and that was it. I was like, same as you, where it was like high school, I can't be fat and start, had a complete binge eating disorder, binged, threw up, binged, threw up. I was bulimic for years because I had no clue. And that's where it started for me. And that's where the self-image was like, if I'm not skinny, I'm not a value. So enough madness, enough madness. And here we are having this conversation and we represent a, a movement. Mm -hmm. A movement towards truth, a movement, a movement of taking back our own self-dignity and marching to the beat of our own drum because all of the food media is out there ready to take us down. And when they take us down, there's the next diet to sell us on. Why yeah. have you? Yeah. yeah. They deliver false promises. Yeah. So speaking of you talked about your child there, and it made me think of my own daughter, which interesting enough, this is kind of opposite of what we're talking about, but she came home yesterday and she was visibly very upset. And she, for the longest time, she wouldn't tell me what was wrong. I finally got it out of her. And she said, 
in class, I could hear these guys talking about me and saying that I'm anorexic. And she gets, she, this is not the first time she's, she, it happens all the time to her where kids make fun of her because she's skinny. She hurt. She's just like her father. Who's this little, like just skin and bones. And she's got the same body. She's very obviously not anorexic because if anybody actually knew what an anorexic looked like, they're skinny all around. My daughter has the most perfect female physique that every woman would die for. She's got breasts, she's got hips, she's got a butt, but she's skinny legs, skinny arms. And she's constantly being told that she's anorexic and it drives her crazy. And I'm like, this is so horrible that this is what high school is doing to kids. And I'm like, the fact that everybody back in high school in my day had bodies like her, we were all, most of us were naturally thin. And I think that for the ones that weren't like ourselves, that were a little bit overweight, we had such a tough time because there wasn't a lot of weight issues back in, in that time when, when we were in high school. It's more common now for girls to be curvaceous, I think, because of all the hormones and the food and all of the, you know, and just the bad food out there in general. So it's a lot more normal for girls to be curvaceous than to be that really rail thin sort of look to them. But what can we do, Tracy? Like, I know you talk about this, about mothers of young girls and like, how can we help them like what's the message that we're trying to get through to these girls that are dealing with this kind of stuff that's such a great question nobody's ever asked me that in an interview before and i love it and as i'm hearing you talk um i'm putting myself in the shoes of being back in high school and you know boys are such jerks like they deserve to be punched in the face because what yeah. they see the girls about their bodies, that leaves an imprint in a lot of them, myself included. And uh, I think to answer your question, shouting out to the moms out there and, you know, I hope I have a granddaughter. And I think, I think it's important to make sure that they know that they're loved. Obviously that's number one. And number two, dial into how you can help them have experiences in their life that build their confidence, mm -hmm. right? And I do not envy any moms out there with teenage girls or younger right now, because we didn't have social media back in the eighties. Uh -huh. And I can't even imagine how it would, I can't even imagine the damage, you know, um, so you definitely have your work cut out for you there, but girls need to feel loved by their families, obviously, you know, number one, and they also need outlets to have small wins, small wins to feel, to feel the taste of success, to feel confident in their skin. I have a friend who lives a couple of hours from me when her daughters were in middle school. I thought this was just amazing. She would sign them up for 5Ks and they would do 5Ks. They would do other little events like that to have these small wins. They would walk around, walk around. You don't have to be a runner, but these. she was investing her time and getting her daughters involved in avenues where they could experience small wins, small wins mm. to build that confidence. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And they, I feel like they have it so much harder than we had it because of social media. Like my girlfriend was just saying her 15 year old son is, is talking, who's gorgeous is talking about the fact that he thinks he needs a nose job, like, oh, you know, wow. because of what he's seen on social media. And he's just, he's trying to live up to these standards. And I know that my daughter does too. I know that every teenager out there does, they are, they're comparing themselves to these what they're seeing online. And so none of them feel like they're good enough. Not one of them. And I'm like, how is it that my kid who has the perfect body, who should not have any hangups about it, has hangups now about her body for being too thin? Like that just is like, yeah. oh, yeah. it just blows my mind. Oh, but yeah, I don't know. It just came up yesterday. So I just thought, a little bit relevant here with our discussion today because it's the opposite. I, I told her to say to those boys, I said, you know, ask, tell them, 
what if you were anorexic? What do they think that would do to that person? That's a disease. Like that, that's something that women die from because they'll starve themselves. I just interviewed a lady who said she had to make the decision when she was in, when she was an anorexic, it was she going to live or die because she knew that she had to make that choice because she was starving herself so badly. She would have died and she chose to live. You know, it, it's mind boggling to me. We can remember going back in school and in college. I knew a handful of girls that were bulimic with all due respect. You shared uh, your challenge. Uh, and I knew some girls that were anorexic and, you know, God gave me this gift. I'm like a camel. I can't throw up, but if I was able to, I can't even throw up when I'm, when I need to, when I'm sick, which it doesn't happen often, but I would have gone down that road had I been able to. It's ludicrous that we are bought into the, um, highly palatable foodie society Things taste so freaking good on our tongue that food becomes a coping mechanism for soothing, relief, comfort, medicine, checkout, reward, get out of my way, rebelling. Yes. And that's not our fault. It's not our fault. The obesity rate in children, it's not their fault. No. The, The parents are being sold the food and it's a generational thing. You're seeing this. Right. And so, yep. you know, like my, my parents did not have a weight problem. I was, I was the chubby kid, my generation, you know, we had kids and then the processed food nation grew and grew and grew. And now you're having parents that are obese that are having children obese. And now it's like, what chance do these kids have to say, Hey, I want the apple and the almonds rather than the hostess fruit pie, whatever it is these days. Yeah. So there needs to be really a shakeup and it, it involves, it involves us as individuals, I'll say one woman at a time, Mm -hmm. deciding that she wants to open the door to truth because we all have our answers inside of us. That's one of the things I talk about in the book. And I help women go inward and try to find where their answers are. You talked about trusting your intuition and inner wisdom. That's how we eat. Our intuition has the solutions and the answers for how to eat to sustain our our best all year long without ever going on a diet again. And if that sounds daunting and woo woo, I totally get it because I would have been one of those people. I don't want that book. Where's where's the newest and greatest? Yeah, (laughs) it's so true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, what what do you find? Because you've worked with a lot of women with their sugar addiction, yourself included. Do you find that most of the root cause of sugar addiction is something that is emotional that they never dealt with in their past, a childhood stuff? Like what do you see a pattern or is it just simply most of the time that sugar is very addicting and they got off on the wrong foot because of parents and what they fed them or just because of what they ate because of what's in our environment? I'd say it's a combination of all of it, but to answer your question, absolutely yes, for emotional reasons. And I, I mentioned before that my my typical client is someone who's already doing all the healthy things. Mm-hmm. Uh, they might have a little bit of weight to lose, but they're eating healthy. They're fighting the healthy food. I mean, they, they've got structure and all this stuff and they don't understand why they can't stop the impulsivity of turning to sugar in those moments. Yeah. And for those reasons, um, a lot of times because because we believe that we need to eat so squeaky clean, healthy, and we can kind of over control, we forget that the eating experience and our food choices should give us satisfaction and pleasure. We've learned to fear that if we enjoy our food too much, well, we might eat too much and we might gain weight. So we have to keep rigid controls on this squeaky clean, healthy food. And I have a couple of clients where like their food library was like 10 things they're bored to death wondering. And they, I, I had one client, I almost referred her to somebody else because she was insisting that she was addicted. She did not want to go there about feelings, emotions or anything. And then we finally started examining what she was eating. It was the same things every day. And um, there was limited pleasure. There was a fear of pleasure in food. And then there was this, this, this uh, impulsive, 
I don't want to want the sugar, but I do every weekend because I'm addicted to it. I'm addicted to it. And so we had to break that down a little bit. Like, let's really talk about this. But she really wanted to just check the box. I'm addicted. I can't help it. I'm addicted. But when we kind of had to do some wiggling around, she discovered how to expand her healthy food library to, to give herself permission to enjoy her food and to bring pleasure back in slowly. And it was hard. But guess what she stopped doing on the weekends? She stopped binging on sugar and she also found peace with it. So mm -hmm. now she can go, like she likes to get together with friends for events and everybody brings something. And now she can have a sample of whatever she wants and it doesn't turn into an all out binge because she, she discovered what was missing, which was she was so rigid with her food program and she wasn't giving herself any wiggle room at all. And it was creating this like cage tiger effect. Yes. So that is emotional. It's emotional, yes. but it also came from the over control for good reasons. She was trying to be healthy. Yeah. Do you see where the diet mentality gets on our way? It sells us on something and we become crazy. A lot of, a lot of us are, are rebelling against, look, I'm sick of doing this. I just want to have some fun. And there's a little girl in all of us that when we go on a diet, we put her in a little chair in the corner and we say, you're in timeout. Don't speak. And she'll sit there for a little while, but eventually when we eat something off plan, she jumps out of that seat and she's running a muck in Toys R Us. I want everything. Get out of my way. I want to have some fun and I don't want any rules. Yeah. That was kind of how I reacted. Yeah. But I've always said like human beings were, were hedonistic in nature. We don't want control. We don't want that like you can't have, you can't have, you can't eat that because it's bad for you. We'll rebel against it because we want to have the pleasure. We, we, we lean towards pleasure. We go away from suffering. And if you think that eating healthy is suffering or you're so rigid that you are suffering, it's a matter of time before you lean towards the pleasure. Well, you know, food was given to us for enjoyment. So we will eat. So we'll stay alive and procreate. Yes. Yeah. We're hardwired for it. Yeah. And when we try to wrestle with our appetite, which is a natural biological instinct, we're barking up the wrong tree and it always ends bad. Yeah. So this is what I help women do. And that's a lot of what I talk about in the diet free diva. Yes. So let's, can we give the listeners just kind of where does somebody start? So they're listening to us. They're going, check, check, check. This is me. This is me. This is me. <laughs> what do I do? How do I start? Um, obviously get Tracy's book first and foremost, but can you give us a little, you know, a little hint of what's in the book as to kind of a, what, what's a few steps that somebody could start with to stop the sugar addiction? Yeah. Well, my book is a combination of like the chronic dieting and the sugar addiction as it relates to like emotional eating. Cause I talk a lot about, um, learning to become self-aware, learning how to do what I call a personal inquiry where we, we check in with ourselves because none of us learned how to do that. And most of us didn't. Mm -hmm. So in the diet free diva, I actually outlined five steps uh, to freedom with food, body, and self on your trusted and sustainable terms. Ooh, so you never have to go on a diet again. And I'd like to maybe share what these five steps are in the book yes. real quick. Yes. And if anybody wants more, I, I'll, I'll give my website and all that stuff. But anyway, yeah. step one is write your food story. So I, I, encourage you, I show you how to go back and look at your roots. It's a very powerful experience because we can't get to where we want to go unless we look at where we've come from. And I talk about this concept called the childhood backpack. And we unpack that together and we examine what's in there toss out the old and we fill up with new. And step one, write your food story. Step two, um, we talk about values and developing a personal powerful why. In other words, who are you and what's important to you? And I, I give you steps to work through that. Step number three is mastering self-awareness and learning how to do a personal inquiry, which means learning how to tap into feelings and emotions the mature way to be able to meet our needs authentically, because most of the time it's not food that we really need. It's usually something else. Mm -hmm. Step four, now we talk about food. And I do believe that in order to be healthy and to understand that food is our friend, we do need to clean up our palate. 
So step four, I talk about a 14 day whole foods cleanup experiment. It's not a diet. We, we basically give ourselves a power spraying and it's like a reboot. And we train ourselves to really, and I mean this, be that person who wants that green apple and those almonds or whatever your healthy snack might be. And if the little Debbie addict, former seventies addict can really want a green apple and nuts, anybody can do it. Yes. So I cook for that. And number five is loaded. Step number five, it's the diet free diva toolbox. And this is where I, I take you step by step and I help, I help you understand how to plan, how to strategize in a foodie society that's going to try to get you to eat the, eat the donuts, trying to get you to buy into all of the commercials and the Uber Eats and all of that. And then I also help you understand how to keep your promises to yourself and regain that self-trust. Now, a diet-free diva is that woman who has found freedom and peace with all foods, including sugar. There's been a shift of power here with sugar. It doesn't own me. I own it. I step into new shoes and I'm making, de I'm making decisions based on the sugar. It doesn't control me anymore when you go through these steps. A diet-free diva is that woman who is finished with the war on food and body. She knows what to do to sustain her health. She feels amazing. And because of that, now she has all this leftover energy that she spent on the diet wars now she's doing that thing that she does really well out in the world. We all have something that we do really well and we know it. Maybe it's a few things, gifts, talents, skills, something that, that you do really, really well that you've been putting on the back burner until you get the weight off, until you figure out how to eat right. You just need to lose the weight first. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. It's time to stop the insanity, figure out the food and body answers that you have in your heart. I help you do that so you can get out there with your purpose and that thing that you do well, and that feels pretty good. You're going to feel fulfilled and abundant and you're living your life on purpose. That's a diet free diva. Oh, I love it. I just had a friend the other day that she's addicted to sugar. And she said, I, I've realized that my, the reason I think I'm so addicted to sugar is because I don't have a job. And she said, when I, I feel like I don't have a lot of purpose and she's been, she, she has a business that's done so well that she retired when she was in her early forties. So she's, and her husband's very wealthy. So they just, neither of them have had to work. Um, probably over that actually, maybe before forties, but she said, my sugar addiction has gotten so out of control. And she said, and I think that if I went back into my business and started doing something with it and working in there again, that I don't think I would have that sugar addiction anymore because I need a creative outlet and I don't have it. And so I turn to sugar. I was like, that's amazing that you've just realized that. But I, you know, you see that a lot where that, that that's what's driving the sugar, any addiction really right? Is that they're not tuning into their purpose. They're not to going, they're not honoring what they should be doing. I think. Well, from a holistic level, we all have buckets in our life buckets. And it, it sounds like, you know, that's a great example of your friend where maybe like a purpose, her yes. bucket of purpose was empty and yep. sugar was filling up that void in her heart that something was bothering her. There was something that was bothering me all those years that I was using sugar for a variety of reasons to fill up. So that's a really great, great point, Karen. Listeners, um, listeners on the show here, think about that. Like if you're struggling with sugar, it's a symbolic substitute for something that you really need. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to get out of, out of our own way without support and without community, without talking through this because sugar feels good. I mean, it taps into the brain and it's a quick hit and it's, it's what, five minutes. We start to feel crappy shortly after, let's face it. Yeah. It really is a quick thing, but there's always an unmet need. And it's, it can be so frustrating to identify that and um, talking through it, mm -hmm. writing stuff on your food story, looking at where you've come, going through your values. This is how we find, oh my gosh, wait a minute, I'm off. Like for example, I was working in fitness, Karen, when I worked with Daniel Dame, I was working in fitness and I was exhausted. My heart was just crying to help people 
they were coming to me for exercise and they thought that was the solution. And I knew it wasn't, I knew it wasn't, I knew they were also addicted to sugar or other, other, other foods. And that's what I really wanted to help people with. But I felt like such an imposter because I'm eating the sugar too. So that bucket for me, that fulfillment and something about my inner purpose was really empty. I mean, it was bone dry and I, I couldn't get out of my own way. I kept filling it up, filling it up with the sugar because I felt good. I could close, close the light, turn off the lights. Someday I'm going to deal with the sugar problem. But for now, I just need my thing. Yeah. Which is no different than drinking or taking a drug to numb yourself. So you don't have to face what's in front of you and what's, what's going on, but those hard things to look at, it's no different. You're still, you're numbing yourself with sugar or food, carbohydrates, whatever it is you, you're to, numbing. Get, to get out of our own way. We really need someone that understands to give us the support that we need. And the work that I'm doing now within that zone that I just described is the most fulfilling work I've ever done in my life mm -hmm. is helping women discover what they're missing. It's almost like you open up a new door and you start walking ahead and it just feels liberating and women need help because a lot of us are trapped in this thing called I'm using sugar and I don't know why, and I can't get out of my own way. So people like you and I are helping women. Hey, we understand. Take my hand. Let's talk about this and this and this. It is yeah. scary. It is difficult. It is uncomfortable for a time period. And then there's like a pot of gold on the other side. And it's a journey. Yeah. yeah. And I always say, you know, where are you going to be in one year, two years, five years, 10 years, if you don't do it, do this now, if you don't start looking at this, you're, you're going to just keep this vicious circle going where going on one diet, going to the next diet, going to the next supplement, whatever it is, it'll keep happening until you finally are ready to face these things. So, and I know that you, we were talking about group coaching before we started to air. So you do have a group coaching program, which I have to say group coaching, it's my absolute favorite. I know it's one of your favorite things too. And to be part of a camaraderie of women that understand where you're coming from, understand what you're going through and you're going through it all together. There's something to be said about that. I definitely think like one-on-one's great too, but I do have to say, I love, love, love group coaching. So what do you have? Um, you've got group coaching, you've got one-on-one -on -one, what, book. What else? Tell us, tell us everything. <laughs> yeah, so if you go to my website, um, www.theholisticdivas.com, you will see the link to my book. You'll also see, and I want everyone to go ahead and, and get this because I, I just revamped it. I'm so proud of it. There's a workbook where I help you step-by-step step go through the five steps to freedom with food, body, and self. It's a downloadable workbook um, that's on the front page of my website. There's also a contact me where you can fill out my, the information and get on my waiting list for my next group coaching program because um, when I do my group coaching, it's in blocks of time throughout the year. And I devote hundred percent to that. And I also have lots of um, juicy freebies on my website. Um, so basically, if you want more information, just go ahead and fill out the contact me. I also have a private Facebook group called diet free divas, just diet free divas go ahead and join my group. And I talk about things in the book and I, I, the women in my private group, are women that have the unwanted eating concerns that I discussed here with the sugar, with the chronic dieting, with um, stress eating, menopause challenges, all of that. And we we just have a blast in that group. Uh, so I, I'd love to meet you. I'd love to chat. And when you, when you do click the contact me, we can set up a one-on-one -on -one call where I can help you work through these steps in a one-on-one -on -one call, especially starting with your food story. Cause I love hearing, hearing other people's stories. It's so much fun to listen to somebody's food story. It really, really is See the epiphanies that come out in them when they talk about their past is something that just touches my heart because it's powerful. It's, it's really, really powerful. So amazing. Uh, well, I'll link to everything in the show notes so that you guys can find her very easily. Um, Tracy, thank you very much for coming on the show, sharing your story, being vulnerable and open. And I think that that helps people more than anything is just to hear somebody's truth, I think, is like to know where you came from. And it really wasn't that long ago. Like, that's amazing that 
you've done all of this in the last couple of years and now you're helping others do the same. So thank you. you know, I've, I've always found that um, people want real people. Yes. They want people they can relate to. If I see one more fancy schmancy 50 some year old woman trying to sell, don't you want it to be just like me program online? I mean, it makes me nuts. So I personally find inspiration from another woman that is the real deal that gets it because there's a connection there and we thrive on authentic connection. And you're one of those authentic people, Karen. And I'm, I am humbled and honored to be um, a part of your podcast and to be a part of your community. And I really appreciate this. It's been great. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. We'll talk again soon. Okay.